spring, we knew it was sunshine, but not weather. And I knew it was spring because I saw Russell oh, yeah. Lowe's come back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's just a few things here in the bulletin for you guys. I won't read it all to you. Just some highlights for you. Board meeting is coming up uh, a week from tomorrow. And something I'm really excited about, I see a top bar. That's what I just said. Three weeks. Um, in between that, we have the Chimes Choir. I believe that's at Maiden Lane. Is that correct, David? Yeah. At Maiden Lane. So come out and support all of our uh, Chimes Choir along with uh, how many different churches are going to be there? Um, last year, I believe there were eight different churches. Um, hearing them all play at once, that's, that's what's really cool. Um, I'll also let you guys know, um, we talked about it last week, but just a reminder that uh, May 4th through 6th is a youth retreat for 7th grade and up, and Karen is the one you want to contact about that. Obviously, Karen's not here today, but get hold of her if you're interested in that. Um, oh, the prayer request. Um, if you guys could, during our prayer request, either contact any of the elders or Jen, or even on your bulletin, or no, it's outside now, right? Yes. All right, out on the desk, there are forms to fill out. The reason for that is when we do the prayer request, that gives us an opportunity to follow up. So, you know, we can put in the prayer request, and we can follow up with you and, and figure out how things are going. So please keep mind of that and do that when possible. Um, I believe that's all the announcements for today, so let's open the prayer. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for your church. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and worship you and, and learn more about you. Um, please be with John as he goes through our service today. Please be with our worship team. Um, allow us to be lights here in our community as long as, uh, and as well as pervasive, pervasive within our, our realms of meetings that we have with people. Um, let them wonder what's different about us and allow us to talk about you with those people. We pray with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to read to you from 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just give us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Why don't you stand and sing with us this morning about being in the light.
years, she'd come in and I was standing halfway in the aisle. I'd give her a good elbow. <laughs> and I told her to ask her, she got them kind of elbows at Edison State. So I had But uh, this time of our service, <clears throat> time for prayer requests and praises. And Charlie, yes. I've seen something, and I want you to share it with the. Well, who was bitten by the rattlesnake? Uh, I had a foster, two foster boys back to my first wife before she had passed away. And we were in the presence of adopting them. But anyway, his, there's one left. One was killed in an auto accident years ago. But the other one, uh, his six-year-old son was bitten by a pygmy rattlesnake Ooh. in their backyard. And he was in the hospital for three days with anti-venom. The anti-venom runs, they got it at a, really a good price. It's $11,000 a vial. Oh. And he had 18 vials. Oh. 18 vials. 18. And their insurance doesn't cover the anti-venom. Oh. Uh, they say it's, I don't know what they say, but they don't cover it. <laughs> and uh, the hard thing is, too, um, they had it on the news down there in Florida, and um, it cost the hospitals maybe a couple dollars to for it, and they charge so much money for it. It can run up to thirty thousand a mile in some places. Wow. So um, I have to prepare for him. He's better now. He's home. Good. And he's, he's doing really well. But it was touch and go there at, at the first time. It was a, a child. A pygmy's worse than a dying bat. They said for a child to be bitten by. Yeah. But it was a big pygmy. It was eighteen inches long. And it was under his swing, he was out on his swing, and he came down with his feet, and the thing did it. Okay, well, remember that in prayer, and also there's a need there, maybe we'll look into that, <coughs> helping them some way or form. Julie? Roman was telling us in class this morning that he'll be moving. At Who? Roman at the end of uh, the school year and so we're sad about that but we want to plan a party so I don't know what we're going to do but we need to do some kind of party to send him off somehow. Is Roman moving to Carolina, is that correct? In Tennessee. Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember that? Yes. I have a phrase. Here's yeah, about I read more, about that. More lessons again. And also, starting this month through July, she's going to be having a lot of different scouts come out and look at her for different colleges. Wow. So, what was her achievement award? She has the award of excellence, just that she's an all-around great student that can achieve so for the Franklin City Schools. <coughs> Wonderful. Proudly, Kirsten. Yay! Yay! Okay, somebody tell me again. Uh, I'd like everybody to remember, remember Nikki. Uh, she's very depressed. Uh, Nikki very very rarely gets depressed. She's to the point where she sits and cries at times. Uh, on the 30th of this month, which is a Monday, um, she has to go to Columbus to Ohio State University East to the doctor. Then they're going to admit her for that week. And they're going to do a new type of wound back on her leg where they insert things down into these three holes she has at her knee. And it's supposed to do some sucking and all, but she has to stay in the hospital for it under a controlled environment. And she's, she's pretty depressed about it. And so if okay. everybody can remember her. And I'm sorry, her. Nikki is your wife. Yes. Yeah. I, keep, I, I keep teasing her and telling her she's doing it because the 30th is my birthday and she's doing it for my birthday. <laughs> so I'm going to the resort right. and all that. I bet you that went over good. <laughs> 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 you remember that in your prayers too also. Others? Yes, yes. I had some tests this week. I've been having a, a lot of heart palpitations. And I do have a heart murmur. So but I had a lot of tests on Friday and then I had their 24 hour monitor. So um, I don't think there's anything because they would have seen it and, you know, did something, but just prayers that all of them come back okay. Okay, thank you. So i like back then. Yeah, uh, just to praise Danny, yesterday had to do her solo and ensemble for band. Uh, she did the marumba and she got a uh, superior for that, so it was really good for her. Good for her, yes. 
Yes, go ahead. Again, Father, we pause to give back to you a portion of what you give to us. You are a great God, loving God, loving God and comforting God. We know you are in control, in control of everything that goes on in this world. We just ask you now as we give back to you a portion of what you give to us, that you bless it and use it in this community and church. In Jesus' name.
playing outdoor track. We're already training for bobsled, <laughs> speed skating. Uh, we got a downhill. Uh, you've got an alpine track team, you know. So we've got the whole thing going there, but it has been crazy. And. Uh, you know, but one of the neat things about it for our kids is, you know, we keep training them pretty hard. I mean, they would like to have a meet eventually. I mean, that's kind of the point. You know, you, you go out for a sport. You don't go out just to practice all the time. Uh, practicing, you know, that gets old after a while. It gets boring. You want to be able to, you know, take what you've learned and all that preparation and put it into, you know, into practice. You want to get out there and compete. It'd be nice if we could actually get out there and do that. We have kids, uh, last week, they, were, they trained so hard. I was so proud of them. Um, we had kids that were just physically spent. We had, uh, we had the, some poor kid, he's got the nickname now, the barfer. Because after about, you know, 10, 150s, he's, you know, let's have one big hurl for the hill climbers, you know, or something. So, you know, we'll do that. You know, why... Why go through all that training, all that running that you do in practice? You know, there's got to be a point to it. The kids know that in, in the end, if, if we ever get to have a meet, you know, they get into a race, it's going to benefit them. That's why we practice. You, know, you get out there, you work at it, you work at it so that finally you can get out there and, and let it go. And, but one thing that we don't let them do is we don't let our kids complain. I don't allow them to cry about the weather and cry about, oh, we never have a meet, and I hate this, and we gotta go do, the, you know, man. I said, no, we're not gonna cry, we're not gonna complain about things, because that doesn't, doesn't solve any problems. We have to understand that, you know, things are gonna happen in life that you don't have any control over. You're just gonna have to learn how to deal with things that happen. And uh, we have the power to, uh, to learn how to respond to different things. I'm going to steal some, uh, move ahead here, I don't know if you can, uh, Keitha will probably shut her back there, she's seen this before. This is something that Graham that we've been working on this year. Um, uh, no BCD, no blaming, complaining, or defending poor performance. Okay, so, uh, and a lot of this comes out of... Uh, leadership training from a man named Tim Kite, who uh, got to be good friends with Urban Meyer, who applied these principles with Ohio State, and through that, you know, he uh, was able to, uh, to have high school coaches, he has a real good relationship with them, and, and uh, anyways, this is starting to filter down now into the schools, and it's sort of the philosophy of how you practice, how you train, how you, you conduct yourself, and and we learned this, this little formula. Here's my our girls' track team. Okay, we're, we're a few in number this year, but we're mighty in, uh, you know, in work. We're getting after it. Now, we don't have a lot of athletic talent, but that's not the point. In track, you know, every meet you try to do a little bit better. You, you're, you're really only running against yourself. You know, try to improve. One of the things that we teach them is that you know, life is made up of what we call E plus R equals O. E is a, an event. Those are things that happen to you. You don't have any control over that. Things just happen. R is your response to that, how you choose to respond, and then that would equal an outcome. So if you want to get a favorable outcome, if you want to get the kind of outcome that you can live with, the one that you want, you want to be a real good player, you want to be a real good student, you want to be a do real good at work, the only thing you can change in the equation is your response. You can't change the event. Things are going to happen. But you can alter the outcome if you change your Response, the way that you respond to things. So if things happen, you now have a choice. How do I respond to this? Do I you know, respond to it proactively so that I can kind of shape the result that I want to have? Or do I just sit back and let things just sort of occur and then have to be satisfied with whatever happens? 
Well, the Christian life, I think, is very similar to that. Uh, over the last four or five months, you know, we've talked a lot about how things happen uh, in life. Things, many times, things that we, we don't like. These are events. These are things that, that occur. Despite hard times, we have to, to push on. God, you know, throughout our life, these events happen. Some of them, I believe, are divinely appointed. Things that occur, and God had a plan for this to occur. But the great question is, how will you respond to that? So that you can get an outcome that's... Christ-like, that's favorable to you, that's favorable to the kingdom of God. And the New Testament speaks a lot to this, how um, you know how we're supposed to deal with things when, when life gets tough. In other words, there's a, there's a prescription for our response, how we should respond to things, so that in the outcome, it's what God had intended for us all along. We've talked about how and God is not going to force things to occur in your life. You have a choice to make about things. Um, but things do happen. I spoke to a member um, of the church recently. And this is somebody who, because of the choices in their life, have, um, it has resulted in, some, in severe financial crisis for them. Loss of a job, loss of the money, can't pay the bills. That results in now you have to rely on your family. Uh, they got kicked out of the apartment. Now they're living with uh, a sister. And this person feels very, very demoralized. Feels very down. Feels like a failure. Does God really care about me anymore? You know, okay. That's an event that occurred. We can argue about did God cause that to happen, or you know, is it because of the choices that, that we all make? Sometimes we have consequences that we have to pay. But the fact is, an event happened in that person's life. And what we talked about is how are you going to respond to this? That's what's key. You can't go back and change what's happened. It's done. It, it happened. How are we going to respond to this? Moving forward, if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 1. James is a book in the New Testament. James is one of those books, at least for me, when I read through it, there's a lot of gut punches in there. Uh, I'll be reading along and flopping up, boom, man, that hurt, because that hit me right where, man, he's talking about me here. Well, anyways, in James chapter 1, and James, it's believed, was he may have been the half brother of, of Lord Jesus, uh, one of maybe a son of Mary and Joseph. Um, I've heard some other interpretations, but the point is, this person knew Jesus personally and calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so he writes uh, a letter to the, uh, the 12 tribes. That, that's common for the Jews. So he's sending this out. And, and what I want to focus in on here is James, uh, really verses 2 through 4. James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is kind of difficult because what James is suggesting here is that in the middle of some trial, some event that's really testing him, he says, how do we face this? He says, to face it with joy. That's, a, that's a, an R on our little equation, E plus R. You know. you know, what's one response to uh, you know, something, uh, a trial, something you're facing? He says, consider it all joy, my brother. And you're probably thinking, why would I be happy about things that happen? I've heard some of the, the, the prayer requests today. 
some of the things that are going on with, with different families, and we know that you know, there are some trials going on. Why should we, you know, why not face them with, with anger? I feel ripped off. I feel cheated. Why didn't God do this? Why didn't God make that snake wiggle a different way? You know, why did he bite that kid? Why, why did, uh, you know, or whatever. James is suggesting we face them with joy. And he says this for a reason. He says to the Christian, trials have a purpose. Now, I don't know if the lost can really benefit from, from trials. You might be able to get through stuff and it might make you, you know, tougher or whatever. But in the case of the Christian, God uses trials, he uses events, he uses different things for a purpose. And it's to produce steadfastness so that we can become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Through, through these tests, you know, a Christian will learn to withstand the pressure of these trials, at least until God removes it or the kingdom comes. We learn to cherish the, the benefit of it. The, the result of this is, is steadfastness. That's the ability to stand up to trials. Uh, it's interesting. I've, I've read stories and talked to people how all of us were prone to certain, certain sins, certain things that you know, might trigger uh, an act of disobedience. And it takes, uh, it takes training, it takes purpose, so that when you get into the game, when it really matters most, you're able to withstand temptation. You're able to withstand certain things. There are certain things in my life that I have to avoid. There are certain triggers that if, if I expose myself to things, I mean, I'll be right back in sin. I can't afford that. So I avoid it. And it took a long time to learn how to, to do that. Okay, and I, in a way, I'm thankful that I had these these issues. Now we've all got problems, so I'm not up here. Oh man, John, he, he's like a horrible person. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, we all have things that we deal with, but in a way, because of that problem, I am much further along in my Christian life than I ever would have been if I didn't have trials. If I didn't have to to deal with things. Instead, I look at it as a chance to uh, produce steadfastness. I've learned how to stand up to certain temptations. Not because it's going to make me righteous or holy or better than you, but simply for the fact that it's going to allow me to become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That allows me to have a deeper connection, a greater trust in Christ. You ever notice how if you fall to temptation, how easy it is to revert back to like Adam and Eve? What did they do when they got when they sinned against God? Got dressed. Yeah. Got dressed. <laughs> they hid. They were embarrassed. You know, when I if I do something stupid that I shouldn't do, instead of yeah, instead of praying and repenting and and maybe uh, putting on some good Christian music, I'll get in the car and drive to school. I have Metallica, you know, cranked up. You know, that's that's not going to make things better. The point is, I feel this disconnect from God, and I'm ashamed. Lord, don't look at me. No, <laughs> you know, don't look at my shame. <laughs> you know, it's it's embarrassing. But because of trials, because of temptation, because of a willingness to deal with it, it's driving me on to spiritual maturity, which is something I've always desired for many years. I lacked that. Stuck as a baby Christian for a long time. Very interested in the Bible. Love the Bible. Love to talk about the Bible. Not so much applying it in my life. But as James says here, if you approach it with you know, an attitude almost of joy, that yes, this is, you know, I don't like these trials, I don't like these things that have happened to me, but wow, has it given me a chance to, 
to really stretch my legs a little bit, stretch my Christian faith, and help me to grow and push on to spiritual maturity. And I think that is so important. Uh, without spiritual maturity, if we, if we refuse to grow as Christians, we're going to be easy pickings for the enemy. If you turn to 1 Peter, I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 5. And we know who Peter was. He spent a lot of time as one of the disciples. Jesus himself gave him a special place. He said, look, you are my rock on which I will build the church. Now, Peter had some trouble, of course. He was constantly prone to doing things without thinking. I can, I can identify with that. Often did things out of passion. I can identify with that. Uh, made promises that he, he couldn't keep. Yeah, that's, you know. So I, I like Peter in, in a lot of ways. But Peter, after the resurrection, and after the Holy Spirit was given to him, he became a, a different person. He became, as James said, complete. Now a lot of that was because of the power of the Holy Spirit driving him and giving him power. But also, for the first time, he was able to deal with trials and temptations. In fact, many of the disciples, when they would be punished for daring to speak the gospel, uh, there was the group that, uh, you know, they were, they were preaching. The council, the, the Jewish council said, knock it off. You know, take them out, let's whip them, you beat them for, you know, and send them on home. That would make them shut up. And they went home filled with what? Joy that they were considered worthy to be punished for being Christians. The evidence was there. Well, anyways, 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll start at about verse 6. And uh, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He might exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist Him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now it's interesting as we read that. Sometimes being humble, verse 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Being humble sometimes isn't I don't know if that's really seen as an American thing to do these days. Be humble. I know in, uh, in, in, in athletics, a lot of times athletes are they're definitely not humble. They want everybody to know just how good they are. They get on Twitter and they get on TV and they just, oh, 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 you know, me, you know, it's all me. And, you know, and, you know, but God is saying, no, no, no. A humble spirit is something that we need to do, especially when we're under the, the mighty hand of God. What is that talking about, the mighty hand of God? Well, I teach history, of course, and one of the things that I acknowledge, and you may have a different view on this, that's fine, but I think the course of history is operating according to God's plan, His sovereignty. Now, I don't know if every little detail is part of God's plan, but I do believe that God knew that in the course of history, certain things were going to occur. Things like all oh, the, the wars of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, the Holocaust. I mean, I think God knew these things are going to happen. And they're part of a greater plan it's going to bring about, you know, the, the completion of the story down the road. Now, I don't understand that. I like to read history. I like to understand the past to see 
You know, how is the, are all these pieces of the puzzle fitting together? And does it operate according to God's plan and under His sovereignty? I don't understand history all the time. But the point is to humble yourselves and wait on the Lord. By patiently waiting on God, I think we'll begin to understand that He will exalt us at the proper time. A time that's in accordance with His divine will. My mom always used to tell me when I was little, everything, everything happens for a reason, honey. Things happen for a reason. Uh, I had a cousin get killed in a car accident. Things happen for a reason. We don't understand it. And I, I didn't like that answer when I was young. <coughs> As I get older, you know, I kind of look at the course of, of life, and yes, things happen. And if Peter's correct, you know, things happen because in, in, if, if we humble ourselves, at the proper time, he will exalt you. In other words, we've got to hang in there, wait for God's divine will to, to take place. Because we know that God has our back, we can cast all of our anxiety upon him. Uh, verse 7 there, casting all your anxieties. The, word, the Greek word here for to cast refers to the action of covering something up. Uh, when I was a little kid, I would lay on the bed and mom would be trying to put new blanket or new sheets on the bed and she'd whoosh, you know, I'd jump under the sheet and thought it was hilarious and she'd flip it a few times and, and I'd jump out and run and she'd get the bed made and that's sort of the illustration that, that we're referring to, to cast. Throw your anxieties upon God. It's almost like throwing that blanket over and you know, on God. God wants you to throw or cast your anxieties on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. He wants you to give me your anxiety. Give me your, I mean, I know you're struggling. But I've got your back. Give it to me. God wants us to throw our anxiety and our worry upon him because he loves us. There's a friend of ours, actually a friend of, of Kayla's. Her mother has cancer. And uh, she has 11 kids. 11. Now, a lot of them are adults now. But still, this is a huge family. Uh, this is a Christian family. And the attitude of the mother is, I've been blessed with 11 beautiful children. I've lived, had a great marriage, a wonderful life with my husband. Sure, I'd love to live another 20, 30, 40 years or whatever. But this is someone who operates and tries to humble herself under the hand of God. She's not going to cry about I'm sure she's cried. She's not going to complain, be angry, and, and try to, you know. The only thing that she can do is, how am I going to respond to this? And I choose, as she would say, I'm going to humble myself under the hand of God. Sure, I want to get better. But I don't... I don't believe that they take, they're going to do any kind of aggressive treatment or anything. She just, look, I just want to live my life. I'm humble before God. I love God. What happens, happens. And I, I you know, she's going to get the outcome that she wants, which is a life well lived. It may not be as long as others get to live, but there are people who live 80, 90 years, but they never really live. This is a lady who's experienced a lot of joy in her life. It'd be real easy to say, you know, you're cheating me out of, of a future. But instead, I want to humble myself, as the scripture says. I'm going to humble myself under the mighty hand of God, so that in the proper time, He might exalt me. Now, she's casting her cares on Him. She knows that God loves her.
Operating in the shadows, of course, of all this is, is Peter called the, the adversary. And again, the Greek word for adversary, if we move on here, is, uh, actually, let's see, we'll go back. One. Uh, go back to the one with the little devil on there. Where's the little devil? The little devil, there he is. I don't ever want to put a picture of the devil on there, but I thought this was simpson enough, so <laughs> whatever. But yeah, the, the, the devil, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And there's always been talk about who is this devil? What is the devil? How powerful is the devil? Uh, I think sometimes in, in Christian circles we give him too much power. Uh, if he was so powerful, he'd come and murder us in our beds. I mean, he can't do that. Uh, but there's no doubt that the word devil in Greek means the adversary, or almost uh, like slanderer, a liar. And the word you know, adversary is, uh, oh, it's, it's similar to uh, having an opponent in a lawsuit. That, that's sort of what the word... You know, if the Greeks heard it, that's what they would have thought. Well, you know, blood-sucking lawyer, I get it, a devil, I, you know, I don't know. But, uh, you know, the devil is there to accuse, to lie, and uh, he's looking for opportunities, as the Bible says, going around like a roaring lion, looking for somebody to devour. Trying to take advantage of believers who refuse to be humble before God. And, and believers who try to force His hand and rather than sit by and, and allow God's will to take place. Oh, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to make something happen. He and his, his forces are always active, looking for opportunities to overwhelm the believer with temptation, persecution, discouragement, One of my best friends, he grew up uh, Catholic, and he converted to the, uh, it's a, a Mennonite church. I mean, how do you go from Catholic to Mennonite? I mean, that's pretty interesting. Of course, his wife was like, now nah, we're not going to the Catholic church. We're going down here to the Mennonite. Okay, so off they go. But I know in his heart, he still, he struggles with that. He's, he, and he tells me about I've never been Catholic. He said, I have this thing called Catholic guilt. You don't understand, John. You don't understand what it's like. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I, you know, if I screw up, I just feel like God is going to punish me. And we talked about this scripture one time, and I said, you know, that's your, that's your thing. I think the devil could use that as a way to, to mess with you, to make you feel unworthy, to steal your effectiveness. For the gospel. Satan, he sows discord. He likes to stir the pot up and, and mess people up. Like a roaring lion, he's a predator on the prowl. And, uh, you know, again, the word for devil really means slanderer. He's a liar. He tries to take advantage of those who refuse to press on to Christian maturity. One of the things that our church has always done we, in fact, our mission statement, leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, we want to introduce people to Jesus, but that's not our mission. It's to take the people that we have who know Jesus and push them on in a growing relationship with Christ. We want to push you to spiritual maturity. Why? So you can resist the devil in times of temptation. So that when trials come, you can face them with, with joy. You can humble yourself before God. If we refuse to, to mature, if, if we remain as little children, babies, how does a child face ad adversity? I was at uh, uh, Lawrenceville last night for the uh, Northeast Conference, and we were having a there was a nice dinner we were eating, and there were these little kids running around, and uh, they couldn't have been more than two, probably less than that. 
This one little kid had a toy, and it did, he just this other kid water just took it from him. What do you suppose the result was? That little kid didn't show joy. <laughs> he didn't humble himself before the Lord. He threw a fit. Wow! You know, just went nuts. Baby Christians aren't any different. If we've never grown in the faith, when trials hit, when temptation hits, is our reaction any different? We throw a fit. We get angry. We blame other people. Now, I'm sure that little kid had a justifiable reason, a very good reason to be angry. It took my toy. There's nothing debatable about that. I have a right to be angry. The point is, in the Christian life, we want to move beyond that, pushing onwards to spiritual maturity. I've often said, you know, when Kyle gets here, I want him to have a church that's spiritually mature. I know a lot of you are you're heroes to me in terms of spiritual maturity. I wish I could live the life that some of you live in terms of your, your maturity. But I just keep pushing on, hoping that, you know, I can continue to humble myself and at the right time, maybe I'll feel like I'm making progress. And I know some of you feel the same. So how do we stand against this liar? How do we stand against temptation, struggles, trials, things that come about? It, well, the key is to verse 9 here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. Resist him. Stand Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. For some reason, people love to suffer in silence. Christians love to do that. We like to be miserable by ourselves. Oh, I'm miserable, but I don't dare tell anybody at church about it. You know, they shoot their wounded at church. You know, I ain't, I ain't doing that. <laughs> When really, church ought to be the place where we can come and say, man, I'm just struggling with this. Please don't judge me, but I, I, I got to talk to, I gotta talk to you. And you're blessed if you have a friend in the faith who you can do that to, and a person you can go and talk with. But the key is to resist him, which means to stand up to him. Not to run away from him, not to hide from him, but to actively stand up in the face of temptation, in the face of, of trials, and say, no, I am not going to run. I will not be bullied. I will not be cowed. I will not get angry. I will not throw a fit. I'm not going to blame, complain, and, and defend myself. I'm going to choose to humble myself before God. I'm taking that action because I believe that the Bible says... That's what's going to allow me to then become complete. That's what's going to allow me to start to grow up in the faith. The Bible assures us we all suffer the same things. We all have needs. Chances are there are probably other people in the church that have the same needs that you have. And you're thinking, I was the only one. I had some problems with some things and, and I turn to an older Christian and look for guidance and they help me overcome some things and come to find out later there were people, other people in the church that had the same problem, same issue. And here I was running around, oh, I'm the only one. No, no, man, it's a, a lot of people got the same thing you got. That didn't excuse it, but it's like, man, I don't feel so bad now because... I guess we really are all in this together. You know, something about that that helps you to, to understand that. I'm not alone. We remain firm in the faith, which means to continue to live in accordance with God's Word, to press on to spiritual maturity, to know, to study, to obey what you read and what you learn about through the Word of God. Otherwise, you're an easy target. You're an easy target. You've never grown in the faith. You've never moved beyond that point of 
of accepting Christ so that when trials come, what do you have to fall back on? Your easy pickings. And the Bible says here, which is interesting in verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, well, we're all going to suffer at times, but after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. If you're going through a trial, or something has happened in your life that has been life-changing and has been horrible, God has not done that to you to punish you. But He promises us, if we hang in there in due time, you're going to reap the benefit. The Bible says, you know, God causes all things to work together for the good of, of those who love God. God can take any event, and He can use that in a way for your benefit, because He loves you. So after we have suffered for a little while, after we continue to live with the understanding that, look, the day is going to come when God's purpose is realized, we can have confidence that God will restore us. He will confirm us. He will strengthen us. He will establish us. And the result of that is a strength of character. Growing in the faith is important. You know, without a willingness to push on towards spiritual maturity, we'll remain un unable to deal with, with trials. You'll not be able to resist the devil. You're not going to grow in your Christian character. How do we do that? Uh, let's go to the last slide. Um, and scattered out throughout these verses in, in, in uh, 1 Peter, I think God kind of gives you some clues here as to how to do that. You want to grow through adversity? Submit yourself to God. Remain <coughs> humble. Trust. Trust Him. Be sober-minded. Don't lose your mind. When people get freaked out and they get scared and they just lose their minds. And, you know, no. Remain sober-minded. Remain vigilant. Look out, the devil's going around. And he's, uh, re remain hopeful. Verse 10 talks about hope. After you suffered a little while, God's going to do these wonderful things. That brings me hope. Verse 11, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Worship in the midst of trial. Worship him. It goes on, and even in his closing, the final greetings of his letter, he writes, By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is what Peter says to finish this out. Remain faithful. Remain faithful. Verse 13 uh, and 14. Greet people with a kiss of love. Show some affection. All of these things, I think, are important in the growth of faith. So yes, trials and tribulations happen, but we have a choice to make. How do we respond to that? Events always happen in our lives that we have no control over. But to get the outcome that God desires requires us to choose an appropriate response. And it's a kind of a response the world's not going to tell you, but to remain humble, to consider it joy when you're dealing with these types of problems. And in the proper time, have faith that God will exalt you, that he will make you steadfast and firm. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day that we could all be together and we could look at the word of God. We know that things happen, and I pray, Lord, that as a church it would be our mission to encourage one another to grow in our Christian life, to push on to spiritual maturity so that we can be strong 
So that when it really counts, when we're really in the game, we can stand up with Christian character. And we know the response will be as you promised us. God, that you're going to make us whole. Make us complete. God, that's our prayer today. And we love you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The whole time John was talking, all I could think about was how backwards this must seem to the rest of the world to think of trials we're supposed to respond with joy. Um, our enemies we're, we're supposed to respond with kindness. Um, suffering we're supposed to respond with hope and humility and it makes it easier to think backwards like that when our ultimate symbol, um, everything that everything that our faith hinges on is a cross that was meant for death, um, but is actually our victory. So stand and sing with me this morning, my victory. <clears throat>
upside down from what the world, you know, is. We remain humble in the face of adversity. A cross meant to kill ended up being the ultimate victory. What a beautiful thing. Let's pray. Father, uh, as we dismiss today, I pray for everyone here that in their times of trial, uh, that uh, they would patiently and hopefully look to you, Lord, because you love us and you care for us. Help us to remain humble. Help us to, to find the joy in life and to press on towards that and choose that instead of uh, the, the horrible things that the world would offer. God, we love you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless all of you. We love you. We'll see you next week. Have a great week. Six and a half years.